So assuming that the planets can actually survive the supernova explosion, we have yet another problem. As it explodes, most of the mass is going to get blown out into space. So how much mass is left from a typical supernova explosion? So normally the neutron star weighs about one and a half solar masses after the explosion, but the star that exploded was 10 solar masses before it exploded. So you've only got maybe a 15% of the mass left. But you bear in mind the planets before the explosion were in a nice orbit, well, a circular orbit like in our own solar system, which meant that they were going at just the right speed for centrifugal force to balance gravity. Trouble is gravity is now you're 10 times smaller. These things are now then traveling 10 times faster than they need to be. So what's going to happen to them? Well, it means if they have higher than the escape velocity, of course, they're just going to go off forever. And even if they don't, their orbits are going to be really perturbed and be made into big, highly eccentric elliptical orbits, exactly what we don't see. These things, remember, are going in beautifully circular orbits. And you might worry that this star also has gravity, so that'll counteract, but we know this star weighs less than this one because the first one exploded first. Yeah, the more massive stars explode first. But then the second star will swell up at some later stage, possibly engulfing the planets yet again, um, and feeding matter onto the, uh, the uh, neutron star to make it into a millisecond pulsar. And that's another problem. You know, where's the remains of this? There should be a white dwarf left over. Where did that come from? That's right. So we really have a problem uh, of where that star went to. So the obvious thing to do is to come up with a different solution here, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, really, the odds against the planet surviving are being stacked up here. We have just too many problems. Yeah. Um, they have to be too far out. They get swallowed in the red giant phase. They get flung into elliptical orbits out in deep space during the explosion. They get disintegrated by the blast wave. And you know, where's the secondary star that should be there? This is looking pretty dead to me. So if we form it afterwards, how are we going to do that? So one obvious possibility is that there were no planets before or they all got destroyed. Um, but somehow we acquire planets after the explosion. It could be you get the thing explodes, leaving the neutron star in the middle, and some of the mass gets flung out into space. Maybe some fraction, doesn't have to be a very large fraction, goes out but then falls back in again and then forms a spinning disk, a bit like a protoplanetary disk, and that this protoplanetary disk turns into planets. So, okay, uh, I could imagine if maybe, you know, the uh, first object explodes and does this. But the problem is, is we have an angular momentum problem here because the supernova is a big round ball. Things explode. So I know in this case, I really don't have much angular momentum to get rid of because I didn't have any to start with. So remember in solar system formation, the trouble was you turned a big blobby cloud of gas, which had motion, as it got smaller and smaller, angular momentum was conserved. Therefore, it had to spin faster and faster until centrifugal force balanced gravity. But in this case, everything's come out from the middle. It was probably spinning rather slowly then, yep. but it certainly didn't have enough angular momentum to hold it out, otherwise it wouldn't have been a star in the first place. So the gas you expect to come out and fall straight back in again. So why does it end up in a spinning disk? I, mean, I can imagine maybe a little bit of turbulence or something, but there's another problem here as well. There's still another star. Yeah, where's the other star gone? I mean, there should be another star. So maybe we can kill two birds with one stone. We've got problem number one, where are these planets from? And problem number two, where has the second star gone? So possibly we can combine these in some way. So one possibility is that uh, we need to get rid of the second star. Maybe um, it feeds matter onto the neutron star and it somehow gets torn to pieces or disrupted. And so some of the mass ends up in the neutron star, but some ends up in a spinning disk. And out of the spinning disk, planets form. Well, that actually kind of makes sense because imagine you're a star and you're next to this little neutron star and you start giving it more and more mass. So it has a lot of gravity to begin with because it's small and compact and pretty heavy. And you're making it heavier and you're becoming lighter. So I can imagine that, for example, since the size of a star is really a you know, relationship between how much gravity can keep it compact and how much pressure and, uh, will push it out. That is, if I make it lighter and lighter, it's going to have less and less gravity, and the thing could presumably potentially rearrange itself and become larger and larger, making it more susceptible to the main star's gravity ripping it apart. Yes, yeah, so normally you think if you have something, like a planet, and took some bit away, it would be smaller. But as Brian said, this doesn't necessarily work for some types of stars. Some types of stars it does. But just like I imagine like a pile of cushions. 
um, the cushions at the bottom are going to be compressed by all the weight of the cushions above. So if you take cushions off the top, it can actually get bigger because the bottom ones will spring up. Stars, some sort of stars can be like that. The stuff in the middle is compressed by the weight outside. So if you strip off the stuff outside, the stuff in the middle can expand. So you can imagine a planet that gets bigger, uh, sorry, a star that gets bigger, feeds gas, gets bigger still, feeds more gas, until eventually there's nothing left but a little bit of gas which might form planets. So I like the sound of this. And, but it only relies, only certain mm. sorts of stars, fully convective stars, and certain sorts of white dwarf will do this. So you need a very specific sort of star. The other, um, another possible theory is that when you feed all this mass onto the neutron star, that mass is going to fall down the intense gravity and generate huge amounts of X-rays. Oh. These X-rays will come out and zap the nearby star, and that might cause it to swell up and maybe even disintegrate it. So it's sort of uh, this... Uh it, it donates material and sort of gets penalized, uh, not dissimilar to a male black widow, I guess, where you, you try to help out and you get killed for your, uh, your efforts. Indeed, this is called the black widow model, the idea that this could be why so many of these millisecond fossils don't seem to have companions, because the, uh, the, the neutron star ate its neighbor and destroyed it for the benefit of feeding it. Hmm. Pretty nasty. So that's one possibility. Now, how about another idea, which is... We know we have two stars, and you can imagine that one star is a neutron star, and one star is a normal large star. Yeah. So let's assume that the two stars were the very massive stars, yes. and the planets were a long way out. So the, the star will explode and form a neutron star, the bigger one. Uh, and well, let's assume these things are so far out they can more or less survive that. And the second star is so massive that it has enough gravity to keep these things bound. They're probably not in a circular orbit anymore, but they're still bound there. All right, so now we have a big star orbiting, a massive star orbiting a neutron star. And it turns out that in some situations, as it starts feeding that, what will actually happen is the two will merge. The neutron star will fall into the middle of the massive secondary star, producing what's called a thorn jitkov object. So that would be a really interesting star that's not a normal star. Instead of having this normal core that's undertaking nuclear reactions in its core, instead here we have a neutron star, the core of a dead star, incredibly dense. And so you're going to get this kind of shell around it where things are going to be really hot and all sorts of wacko nuclear reactions will be occurring. And it turns out that the prediction is that around this core, the rest of the star will swell out to absolutely gargantuan proportions, so big that these planets, even far out where they are, are now going to be inside it. And now they're inside it, they could continue orbiting. There's going to be a little bit of drag. And it turns out this drag will move them in and turn the orbits into circles. Mm. So if, if they'll go closer and closer in, and they'll become more and more circular, which sounds just like we want. So there has to be pretty pretty well timed, doesn't it? Because if they, they're going to keep going in and the closer and closer they get, the denser it is, the more they're going to be dragged, and the faster they're going to want to fall in. So you're going to have to turn off this process somehow. So the idea is to have a, these things spiral in my circular orbits and then it ends its thorn zit phase and just ends up as a neutron star at just the right moment to freeze them, like a game of uh, musical statues just frozen when the, the music goes off in just the right places. Mm, so it's a very tuned model, although it does sound like it could do what we need it to do. Except uh, maybe the neutron star in the middle isn't going to be spinning fast enough. Oh, that's probably a problem because it has to be spinning at almost a thousand times a second. And this isn't going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of drag and all sorts of problems here to keep that star spinning. So those are three models. Which of them are true? Well, in the time-honored fashion of astronomers, we clearly need more data. What we'd really like is to see some more planets around pulsars.